Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 14th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Okay, uh, this week, once again, the week in charts is uh, brought to you by me. I'm paying for this uh, darn thing here. So um, if you want to help out, this is what you do. You could uh, become part of my trading service, and you go to this link right here, and there's a promo code on that page if you're new to the service you could oops, should be an extra w here you can get started for just 47 dollars and at the end of the show i'll show you once again how to get into the delayed service if you want to get started even more cheaply Good morning joe all right there's a disclaimer screen as usual let me just sum it up all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then okay uh sooner rather than later as far as the delayed service i forgot about this slide if you go in the sidebar of my website, I, again, I probably should clean it up a little bit, and I will be hiring people to, to do these things uh, at some point in 2016. But anyway, the sidebar has a lot of information in here, uh, appearances, webinars, uh, free reports have been updated, and my next uh, appearance outside of my website, uh, as far as like Wicked Charts and all, world tour dates, all that stuff is all in the sidebar, so don't overlook that, and every now and then I'll throw something in there are special. Uh, right here, that's the free foresight and hindsight edition of my service. And I think it's a great way to follow along because you're going to see, I'm going to show you the live portfolio today, but if you were following along within about a week or so, you'd see the live portfolio and you can say, oh, okay, there's a live portfolio. Let's, uh, let's see what happened to those stocks. And it's a great way to get started, if I say so myself. Most of this week's show is going to be a lot of what I said last week but i've got everything updated obviously with a few with a couple of new things that i worked on uh, a little while ago which is really cool i don't i'd rather just show you than tell you about what i'm going to tell you so we'll uh, we'll get right into that uh, one thing i just want to announce real quick next week i will be in hong kong so this will be the last show for a couple of weeks all right well, last week I talked about whether or not it was time to say hello to my little friend, and I think it is, unfortunately. And I don't want the market to go down. And a while back, I guess late last year, I was talking about the fact that we could be in trouble. In fact, all the way back last summer, and um, a couple of you guys and girls told me, "Hey, Dave, stop apologizing. It is what it is." And I appreciate that. And that's when, that's the rewarding part for me when. All my pontification, if that's the correct word, comes to fruition and people actually begin to hear me. So uh, let's stick with those charts again this week. Now, one thing I was thinking about this morning as I was putting my slides together is we can't forget about technical analysis 101, TA 101. And I'm seeing some pretty complex stuff out there lately. And I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, so... I don't want to say what it is because uh, that it, that person might feel, or those persons might feel singled out. But I've been seeing a lot of stuff out there like, oh, this is the, this is this, and this is that, and this wave, this, and this, um, Fibonacci, that. And, and so the bottom line is no matter what you do, and, and, and if you're successful doing those things, then, then do those things, okay? But never forget – Two things. One, everything works better with trend. And when thinking about trend or discussing trend, never forget about the net net market change. So always look at your current close and ask yourself, is it about the same or is it higher or lower than it was a long time ago? And a week ago and a day ago. And never forget about that. OK, and I'm going to come back to this shortly, but I wanted to throw that out real quick before we start looking at these charts. Now. I've been talking quite a bit about this weekly bow tie sell signal. And I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on these slides and a few years back when I was showing these uh, same sort of things happening. Uh, <laughs> I got a lot of emails. Come on, Dave, you're killing us. But I'm going to keep saying this until everyone gets it. But you can see that we did have this weekly bow tie sell signal at S&P 500. 
And a market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most. And um, Gary Kahlbaum had an interesting quote a few days ago, and I and I lifted it out of his uh, his newsletter, and I think I'm going to put it in one of my upcoming columns, first chance I get. And I don't remember exactly how he said it, but basically he said that the bounces punish the bears, and they uh, they. They, they punish the bears and then they they make the they give false hope to the to the bulls and, and I've always felt that way when this thing starts to starts to roll over every time it begins to bounce the bulls get all excited and I think the shorts are more trader types and they all kind of rush to the door to cover at the same time that's why you get these vicious sharp covering rallies and then your bottom fishers rush in thinking that it's the low the buy the dip crowd somebody on Facebook from Italy today posted buy the dip buy the dip buy the dip and they repeated it about a hundred times and I replied don't catch a falling knife don't catch a falling knife don't catch a falling knife a little cut and paste back on that so I think it's a very dangerous thing to catch a falling knife and markets will often do what they have to do to frustrate the most and markets will also do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner and as Rasky once said, if it's obvious that it's rolling over, it's going to have one last big retrace rally and then roll over. OK, so this obviously gave false hope to the bulls and squeezed out all the bears. And then what happens? Then the market does what it wants to do. And. Let's go to a longer term chart here first. OK, now, as I said last week and other weeks prior these weekly buy and sell signals could be very powerful, very powerful in the overall market. And then in individual stocks for that matter too. So now we have a sell signal and there's a question mark here. Now the significance, or I should say the, the major signals come off of all time highs or multi-year highs. So this is a major and obviously this is a major now, this was off of many year lows here. So this is still a major buy. Obviously, the stock market, and God forbid, it, it would never happen. <laughs> we won't see any buy signals off of all time lows. And if we do, then I think we have other um, I think we have other problems. I think that's probably the zombie apocalypse. But for the as far as the buy when it comes to markets, now individual stocks, yes, off of all time lows, you could have a major buy on a weekly. And I kind of miss it. I used to go on a web show uh, once every couple of weeks on Fridays with uh, Doug Newberry and um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Doug Newberry, Bill Bacchetti. And um, I just haven't been on a while and Doug's no longer with the show. But Doug used to always uh, ferret out a bunch of weekly stocks that were making bow ties. And that's something that I'd, I I just don't have enough time to work on. But he would always find a few for the show. And we always had a lot of fun catching major turns in those stocks. So if you do get bored, and some of my clients are doing that now. They're playing around with weekly bow ties on individual stocks, and I think that's kind of a fun thing to do. Keep in mind that your turn might be a little slow because, obviously, anytime you use an indicator, it's just turn a little slower. But before I digress too far, uh, yeah, stocks, all-time lows, uh, indices, major lows. This was a 13-year low, so that counts as a major low. Decade lows, okay? Now, you see a little bit of a signal here, but this was only off a couple year highs so you don't want to completely ignore those signals but when you get one off of all-time highs like like this one and that one charts getting a little messy when you get one off of all-time highs like that one and that one you want to pay attention okay and I know I've quoted Greg ad nauseum but like Greg Morris said we treat all signals as if it'll be the big one and Greg recently retired and but before he retired, he was running over five billion dollars. So I respect someone who's number one been around forever since the earth was cooling. And then uh, he's going to kill me if he hears that. And number two is is, is running five billion dollars or recently ran five billion dollars. So that's a little bit of a concern. Now, this this chart I didn't update this week. But the point here is that everything works better with trend. And last week I talked about how much I love my weekly bow ties when it comes to looking at the overall market. And I always preach, keep things simple, keep things simple. Well, you could simplify that even further and just look at the slope of the 50-week simple 
moving average, which would be a 250-day daily moving average, okay? Because five trading days times 50 would be 250, okay? So that's on a daily chart. Hopefully that made sense. We talked about that last week, so before I digress too far. But notice that the slope of this weekly, now it's going to be a little slow to catch up at times, as many indicators will, but as a general statement, just following the slope of this, I guess I should change my pen color, just following the slope of this, as a general statement, can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So that's kind of the cool thing. It's like when you're sitting here looking at every little tick and watching a five-minute chart, and you're like, it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down, every now and then, just back the chart way out and, and see the forest for the trees. And it, it never ceases to amaze me, especially when I get stressed out, bummed out, in a drawdown, whatever. And I have the same psychological problems that everyone else does in this game. It's like you just get all stressed out sometimes and, and you let the markets get to you. You back that chart way out and you realize how simple, I never said easy, but how simple trends and markets and technical analysis and trading could actually be. Now, I never said it was easy. It's tough, okay? But just simple things like following the slope of that 50-day simple moving average. Now, I wouldn't use this as my only timing signal or a timing signal in and of itself, but it's something that you should pay attention to to help keep you on the right side of the market. And you can see that that 50-day slope has kind of flattened out and has begun to turn down. And if you take it one step further in the simplification, in simplification of things, easy for me to say, just looking at the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average on the upside, just looking at the daylight, you could see that this would have kept you in the market for a long, long time. In fact, there was no daylight to the downside here, but we did come down and touch that 50-day moving average. Obviously, I guess in this case, it's 50-week moving average. Again, 250 on the daily. But when you take the 50 on the daily and you multiply times five to go to weekly, okay, so that's what a 50-week moving average is. But you can see here, we did have a little bit of daylight, and it never really broke down from that first little bar below the daylight. I have a, a system I wrote many, many years ago. I'm showing my age, 1995, if memory reserves, for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. And all that was doing was just looking for a couple of highs below the moving average. It was a 20-day EMA, a little bit shorter-term system. And then you look to short if that – low for if that low of that move got taken out okay so a simple little system like that can help to keep you on the, on the right side of the market again keep in mind what i'm trying to preach here and hopefully i'm not being too convoluted but what i'm trying to preach here is that just look at some of these simple things don't run out and trade them mechanically but even even something like the death cross look at something like the death cross and see whether the 50s above the 200 or the 200 or the 50s below the 200 and know that if one's above the other one's below the other you want to be on that side of the market so now that we're breaking down below the 50 week moving average you as a general statement you want to be on the short side of the market and like Jules said when he was asked whether or not he eat bacon he goes that would have to be one charming pig OK, so on the long side, it's going to have to be a pretty good looking stock for me to get long at this juncture. Now, I, I did update this chart. I wanted to update this chart for you this week. This is the slope of hope trend or the buy and hope, I should say. Obviously, I'm making a joke about buy and hold. And buy and hold will work until they don't. And if we go back a couple of charts, obviously. Everybody gets all excited about buying hold, but as I learned from my good friend Greg Morris shortly after I published Layman, it's, I wish I would have known before because I certainly would have quoted him, but a lot of the the buy and hope, the market goes up 12% a year or whatever it is, okay? And it's embarrassing that it's, it, it's just effing embarrassing. I don't want to get too excited here, but it's embarrassing that you'll have like major – 
radio host. I mean, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. I haven't heard him in a while. But it used to make my blood boil that these major radio uh, hosts holding themselves out to be financial experts are saying, oh, you got to just buy these, these mutual funds that I'm promoting because the market always goes up 12.5% a year. And what was it, Caddyshack? No, it don't, Danny. No, you don't, Danny. You know, it doesn't, okay? And here's the problem with buy and hold. This should be a pretty obvious example here. I mean, if you didn't learn anything in 2000, then in 2007, when the market dropped 50%, that's pretty significant, okay? So if you, if you want to retire somewhere in here, that's good, but let's say your time to retire is, is 2008, 2009, and you're, you're, you've already lost half of your money for retirement. Now, it did come back, but what if, what if you didn't have the luxury of waiting for that market to come back? Okay, So it's an 81-year time horizon as far as why buy and hold works, or if buy and hold works, I should say. And most of us don't have that type of horizon to invest upon. And that's why we have to either short a market when it's going down or just get out of the way. Now, again, the trend is your friend until it bends at the end is, is an old saying. And, and like I said last week, I did a little Googling and, and um, Sakota's name came up. And that sounds like something he would say. So we'll give him credit. But as of today's, uh, or yesterday's close, I should say, on a monthly chart, you could go back a long, long time. This is, we're now, we're now pushing almost to 2013, okay? And if we take a look at the Russell, which we will in just a few minutes, it is 2013. Tom says, looks like the huge head and shoulders formation from those into that this looks like a huge head and shoulders formation for those into that oh um, I'm, I'm not necessarily against the head and shoulders pattern uh, what I like to do is I like to see my patterns set up within these big picture technical analysis patterns so Tom's pointing out head and shoulders um, yeah absolutely absolutely that's that's uh, that's a pretty good looking head and shoulders pattern a head and shoulders pattern you have a peak which is a shoulder, you have another peak, which is a head, and then you have another peak, which is a shoulder. And for me to to trade something on a technical analysis basis, you can't just say, oh, it's a three dogs crapping outside the window uh, candlestick pattern or something or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I see that. Three, you know, Next time I see the three dogs crapping pattern, I decide to short the market. Well, if you can explain to me why that might work or the merit behind it and the, the human nature and the psychology behind it, then, yeah, I might trade the three dogs crap and pat, uh, pattern. So with a head and shoulders, for me to wrap my head around, and I'm just kind of thinking that, well, the market makes this higher peak, so anybody who bought here thinks everything's okay, and then it begins to sell off, and when it comes back, once again, people think it's okay. So it's just a major kind of a topping pattern. And also, you get this big rage where a lot of people have likely bought a market, and once it drops below it, it becomes resistant. So that's overhead supply. And on top of that, if I get a bow tie sell signal, which we did as this head and shoulder is sort of completing, then I'm like, okay, I get the big picture pattern, the head and shoulder, and then I have my signal coming into it. Good morning, Joe. Okay, uh, last week we talked a little bit about how the indices were masked by capitalization. And some of the big names in there are Amazon, Google, Facebook, Procter & Gamble, Home Depot. So let's take a look at that now. So what I did this week with this graphic here was I sorted the S&P 500 by capitalization weighting. So that's going to show me the biggest companies up here 
and then the 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 bigger they are and you, it just goes down from there so so oracle's still a pretty big company obviously and then what's interesting is if you take a look at some of the ones in here let's take microsoft for instance and we'll take a look at all of them in a second but here's microsoft and this is all-time highs if memory serves so here's a stock that has a big weighting in the s p 500. you probably could go way down the list in capitalization the s p 500 and those stocks could go up and down all they want and it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference but if apple and google and the two johnsons and facebook and procter gamble and coke and home depot and disney if Verizon begin to drop, then the market could be in trouble. But the point I was trying to make here, or I'm trying to make here, is that these stocks, this is Microsoft, are just coming off of fairly high levels. Now, last week, go back five days, one, two, three, four, five. Last week, they were at a lot higher levels. Now, I did throw Apple in just because everybody likes to look at Apple. But Apple cracked a long time ago. But if you look at some of these, like Coke, just beginning to break down from all-time highs. Bow tie set up. Take a look at Procter and Gamble, another big company in here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. There it is. Okay, a little bit smaller than AT and T, and actually bigger than Walmart, which I, I found kind of interesting. Uh, the two Johnsons. The two Johnsons is set up as a short coming into today as J and J. The two Johnsons. All time highs. A little bit of a gap down here. A little retrace. Nice base. Bow tie. Okay, it's all there. So that's a short. Facebook, recently coming off of all-time highs in here. Now, Home Depot is a little further down the list, but it's, I think, within the top 20 or top 21 of all stocks. And notice that it's just beginning to break down in earnest, okay? We had an all-time high here. Bow tie, uh, first thrust, if you want to call it that, too, broke down yesterday. Uh, these are... Visa was just making all-time highs here, and it's begun to break down. Disney looks like it's breaking down. It was just at all-time highs not that long ago. It really hasn't dropped that far just yet. Uh, just yet, I think, could be the key word in that sentence. And then obviously Verizon coming off a of high is beginning to break down. So last week I talked about the fact that we had a lot of big cap stocks still at high levels. And this week, especially with yesterday's action, we're beginning to see those big cap stocks drop. Now, I guess before I forget, I need to mention that we're due for the mother of all bouncers in the market. And, and like Kahlbaum said, that's going to that's gonna get the bulls, make it think they, they dodged a bullet. It's going to punish the bears, piss them off. <laughs> and then, of course, it's going to go right back down. I don't know that for a fact, but it might. Now, this is something I did last week also. I kind of feel like last week at band camp. <laughs> So um, if you look at, this, at the spiders going back to the top, which was actually made on May 19th, okay, and we got sell signals in in the middle of the summer on a weekly basis we did uh, towards the end of the summer, right in early September. But the market is down, bases of spiders, 11.39%. And then if you take a look at the RSP, which is the equal weight, OK, so that means that Walmart gets the same. I'm sorry. That means that Sky People Fruit Juice. I don't know if they're in the S&P 500, but let's let's for argument's sake assume they are. Sky People Fruit Juice gets the same weighting that Walmart or Apple or IBM or AT&T or Visa or one of those other companies gets. OK, so when you look at the equal weight, it's down. 15%. Now that's about a 30% bigger drop than the overall market. Last week it was a little bit, it's kind of, you know, fun with statistics, right? Last week it was like 6% versus 9% and change or something like that. And the math came out to right about 50% difference. So the overall market was down at about 50% more than the unweighted index would suggest. So that's not a that's not a huge number percentage-wise, but the, the delta of those numbers is pretty big. It's 30%. In this case, it was 50% last week. 
and that market's beginning to catch up with that the over because these big cap stocks are beginning to drop significantly now here's a scary part when it comes to capitalization and if you have time go in and watch last week's webinar i don't want to spend too much time on this this week because i covered it at nauseam or covered it in detail i should say not on nauseam don't don't know why i have that word stuck in my head um but I covered a detail last week about the capitalization thing. And in summary, the capitalization means that big stocks give a higher weighting. And like I said last week, if you want to be a fund manager and you want to hold yourself out as a stock picker, but you know your clients are going to leave you if you don't at least keep up with the S&P 500, then all you do is you buy a bunch of these big cap stocks, throw them in your portfolio, and just for S&Gs, play with some small cap stocks and it's not going to make a difference one way or the other in your performance. And you could show, hey, look at me. I'm a stock picker. And all you're doing is uh, becoming yet another index fund. But I, I don't want to digress too far. I think I did digress enough last week. But anyway, that's what capitalization is. So if we look at this 11.56% move down as of yesterday's close from the May 21st, peak and I might have had the 19th in the other one but you get the idea this is the high peak as opposed to the high peak close which I think was a was a couple days earlier but anyway over the past six seven months markets down 11.56 percent well what I did was I sorted the stocks by their relative strength so the video is way up here Amazon's way up here the Google's are way up here and you can see a lot of the stocks in here, Netflix, Facebook, are very big stocks. McDonald's, okay? These are very big stocks, and these numbers right here, the capitalization numbers are pretty big. Especially, not so much in NVIDIA, so let's scratch that one out. But in some of these stocks, your capitalization is huge. So again, I think it drives the point home. The bigger they are, the harder they will fall. And you got to realize that these are kind of the last of the Mohicans. So you got a lot of big stocks still in or, or being weighted in the S&P 500 that are coming off of high levels. Okay. Last week, we talked a little bit about how rats leave a ship. I have a column or two out there on my website. If you just go to the little search bar on the website and type in rats, you'll get uh, you'll get the whole column. But my point was that these small cap stocks tend to go first. And we'll take a look at the Rusty in a few minutes, the Russell 2000, and you'll see that. And these are, tend to be the more speculative issues. And then the large cap stocks tend to go a little bit later. At first, even even uh, sort of a, in, a, in, a, in a perverse kind of way, it's almost like the, the money flows into those big cap stocks and they have that one last gasp. And I guess what, what the people are thinking or the rats, if you want to look at it that way, is like, hey, let's buy something that has real earnings and making real money and get away from these speculative issues. Because if it's a real company, it'll, it'll stay afloat. Whereas these speculative issues will just get sold off. And then that spec that large cap turns into defensive issues and defensive issues, so-called defensive issues. The idea is that people still eat and poop in a bear market. So food and consumer durables, it's, I didn't mean to put it so crass, but it'd be so crass, but for lack of a better way of putting it, would still be a good place to be a so-called safe haven. Well, as I wrote in the layman's guide, the trading stocks, even those defensive areas were down significantly, 50% in some cases of war, in 2008. So you can't you can't believe in this so-called flight to safety in these defensive issues. You have to be careful. And here's my little graphic. I'm just going to leave this in here for a while. And I did some updates before this, but this is one going way back to September. So check that out when you get a chance on YouTube. Okay, so the question is exactly how I'm playing it. Well, if you have the delayed service, you're going to see this in about uh, a week and a half. And we've been shorting. 
And I think we just hit the profit target on this one a little while ago. I just put out a tweet on that. And we're looking to take profits along the way, obviously, as they begin to drop. So we did have some longs in here, which were ba was, was making this number not look nearly as well, nearly as good. I don't know if it's proper English. And But now the shorts are beginning to work and the longs obviously got stopped out. That's a testament for money management. So that's the open portfolio right now. All of these are shorts. And I would expect a big bounce sooner or later in here. And that's why we're taking partial profits along the way. We're lightening up. So we took half of these off this morning. So that gives us a little bit less exposure. So you have one, two, three, three and a half full positions, if that makes sense. And now when that comes off, now you have one, two, three total positions, three total full positions. Each position is divided into two parts, the trading loaf and then the trending loaf. We're hoping, and I hate to use the word hope, we're hoping that this part, the trending loaf, turns into a really big number. And we're willing to settle for a small number here just in case the future doesn't bring us that, okay? All right, so if you want to follow along with that portfolio with a little bit of delay, you can get the free service on my website, and that's, uh, again, in the sidebar. Okay, and uh, I recently started podcasting. I've kind of backed off of the columns a little bit. I find that uh, I'm kind of going a little bit more for our quality than quantity, so I've been putting a, putting a few columns out. But what I do put them out, I'm also doing a podcast on them, so if they're too long for you to read or if you're driving or something, then obviously just – Subscribe to the podcast. All right. Let's hop out to the charts. And if you guys want to still – any questions on anything i covered so far? Uh, if not, we'll take a look at the current market conditions. We've got a quiet bunch today. I Don't uh, don't be shy. I see a lot of new faces in here, so don't be shy. Looks like we just broke a record for attendance. So that's great. Um, So let me go over the overall market real quick, and then I'm going to drill down to some sectors, and then maybe some stocks within the sectors. And if you want, if you want to, if you have a question about any stock, your favorite stock or whatever, just uh, you can start asking now. Just do me a favor. Just ask about a stock and hit enter, and then ask about another stock if you have more than one stock you want to talk about. And that way, I could see uh, what questions I've answered so far. Now, it looks at least temporarily like we have a little bit of bounce in play. Let's kind of look at the micro, then work our way out to the macro. So let's take a look at a, just for s gs let's see what's going on with the uh, five-minute P's. So we had a little bit of a sell-off today, and then now we're having a, a bow tie here. And it really hasn't materialized just yet. Your bow tie buy would have been about right here and then if you gave it wiggle run let's say about right there so I wouldn't rush out and play that bounce just yet not that this is a type of trading I want to do I don't want to be sitting here watching the, every little tick like I said in one of my columns one time I had a uh, I kept a, a bucket with a little Lysol in it just in case uh, just in case I had to go because I had to watch every little tick years ago when I was trading S&P futures on an intraday basis and I realized that hey I didn't want to be found dead like this but if you are watching every little tick, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's just it'll make you crazy after a while. It's not quite a buy yet on the daily, although we did get we are getting a little bit of a bounce in here uh, on the uh, intraday chart. So that's the S&P 500. That's the spiders. Let's take a look. Let's go back to cash. So in cash, you can see we had this bow tie off of multi-month highs in here. Now, usually I don't get too excited about a multi-month bow tie, but if it's coming off of, or if it's just shy of all-time highs, then I think it's a significant signal, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit more. You can see so far that slide remains in place, and we're very oversold, and we're due to bounce. But the problem with buying the bounce, buying the dip, as a gentleman said earlier on Facebook, is, as I replied, you know, don't try to catch that falling knife because you never know where it's going to stop. 
So you can see we're on the cusp of taking out those September, October lows. And I think that could get to be ugly if that happens. And again, the weekly basis, you can see, kind of helps you see the forest for the trees. At the least, we haven't made a lot of forward progress in a long, long, long time. Go all the way back to 2014. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Same sort of action going on there too. Everything I just said about the P's applies to the quack. And then of course, back to chart out and we have a weekly sell signal. In fact, looks like we could have a double, double bow tie sell signal here. And these can be very powerful, especially when this high takes out this high, when this high is higher than this one, because you have a major double top. Again, remember earlier we talked about the head and shoulders and patterns like that. Well, in this particular case, you have a double top and then you could have a secondary bow tie. And as I've said before, what's the old saying? The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So sometimes you get these second mouse sell signals, especially like on a weekly basis, and it can be very powerful. And the one, I think it was in 2008 when the euro made that second mouse sell signal. Sold off hard out of a bow tie or began to sell off other bow tie, not too hard. Rallied right back up, made that big double top. Go back throughout history and you'll find some amazing tops that were these uh, these second mouse type of things. Kind of interesting. Okay. Yeah, keep the keep the questions and stock picks coming. I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get there in just one minute. Um it's kind of interesting that things matter when they matter and when they don't, they don't. And intermarket technical analysis is is kind of a fun thing. But you got to be really careful with it, okay? Because you would think that falling oil prices would be good for the market. But lately, that's been the focus of the market, and it's been bad for the market. So you can see oil is way down here based on the USO. Let's take a look at the energy stocks. And you can see the energy stocks are banging out new lows. And as I often say, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And that's why you can be very careful catching that fallen knife. And you can see that energy stocks look like they were kind of making a bottom in here. And then they have this one last gas lower. Now, I would never buy a stock based on this pattern. But as I've been telling my peeps in the service, and as you'll hear in about a week, I guess, if you're on delayed service, this does look like a bottoming pattern because you have like this sort of falling three, you know, three drives to the low, if you want to call it that, these falling triple bottom pattern. And then you had that one last little gas lower. So it looks like they're pretty sold out in here. But I would wait for some sort of turning point before I got excited. Maybe that bow tie up or at least a serious first thrust higher. Metals and mining, for the most part, same sort of action there too. Commodities have been really beaten up and uh, taken out behind a woodshed and beaten, right? Gold is kind of interesting. On a relative basis, a little bit stronger because it hasn't really broken down from that base. But you can see these are gold stocks, by the way. And gold commodity looks a little bit differently. But gold stocks are now coming down here towards the bottom of this base. So that's kind of interesting. And we could see some setups here soon. Although I, I will have to admit there's some very speculative issues out in gold, which have already turned. And that might be the beginning of the turn for gold. Let's take a look at gold commodity. As you can see, we did bow tie in here, but so far there's no trigger. It has continued to pull back. I still think this could be worth a trade, but by all means, wait for an entry and use a liberal entry at that. And then stop yourself out somewhere down here at the old lows. Watch last week's Dave Landers the Weekend charts and recent ones where I talked about uh, how to trade a market bottom and how to trade a market top for a little bit more on that. Uh, the rest of the areas just look absolutely abysmal. These areas like the transports, which had been looking horrible for a long time. And this is a little bit more textbook when it comes to like the weekly bow tie sell signal here. Notice we had the weekly bow tie sell signal. And so far, we had a pretty serious drop out of it. And then we did take out those uh, August lows or September lows in this particular case. So this is a little bit cleaner, not as big of a retrace in something like the transports. But pick an area at your leisure, whatever you want to do, or at your leisure, go through all of these and take a look at like banks, bam, losing, uh, drugs, losing, okay? And lately, material construction stocks have been breaking down in new lows, looking pretty ugly in here. And one thing, the only... A couple things I wanted to point out is that the areas that were still at high levels like retail, 
Retail's just coming off of all-time highs in here, okay? Again, this is kind of like a second signal off of all-time highs. Now we're getting a breakdown in here. So this is where it started to get ugly when the last of these stocks that are at high levels are beginning to break down. So that's kind of the sector stuff. And you can go in and watch last week's show and then just – I talked a little bit more about the sectors in. There's really not a whole lot to report other than most of them are looking pretty ugly. And there's no place to run, no place to hide. There's really no sectors right now, at this juncture at least, that you want to rush out and buy. Okay. Gold looks like an H&S reversal coming. We'll take a look at that, GLD. Ah. Uh, I don't see it just yet, but I hear you. I guess that would be the shoulder. This would be the head. And it could happen. A lot of times you'll get these transitional patterns like a bow tie or a first thrust or a gatekeeper. And they'll show up on the right side of that head and shoulder. In other words, in the right shoulder. So I can't argue with that just yet, but it's a little too early. Oh, the stocks. All right, let's take a look at stocks. Okay. Uh, that's No, that's not a head and shoulders. That's more of a more of a base. Uh, uh, if you wanted to call a complex bottom or something, because you got a bottom, a bottom, a bottom, a bottom, you know, just just kind of a base at low levels. Um, I don't see the head and shoulders there, but I'm not going to – I can't really argue with you. You know, you can call it whatever you want. Yeah, Westerners defied ugly yesterday as chart of W – Webster's defined ugly yesterday as chart of IWM. Oh, did I forget to show the Russell? Yeah, the Russell, as I've been saying quite a bit, is the poster child for this market. And it gives you a little bit clearer picture of what's really going on. Now, it's a Russell 2000, but I look at about 2,000 stocks every day. And I enjoy doing that. I get a big cup of coffee, and for the most part, I enjoy it. Um, when the market's going against me, I don't. But... And even then, it's it's kind of a mental challenge to figure out what's going on. But if you're looking at 2,000 stocks every day, you get a pretty good feel for what's really going on under the hood. And a lot of times, I'm always amazed after a couple hours analysis, I just look at the Rusty, and it's all right there. So, yeah, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention it. Always look at the Russell every day. And if you take a look at the weekly Russell, again, here's another case where the bow tie was a little bit cleaner and worked a little bit better. Triggered here, you get a little bit of a retrace. You know, markets don't always go in your favor, right? And then, so far, a pretty serious slide out of that. So, for all, for uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's a successful sell signal on a weekly basis. Even the turnaround went straight back up now. It was worth heating that uh, signal. And then, I think it was a two-day signal. It was pretty powerful a while back here. We talked about quite a bit where you had a two-day signal here, and this would have been your shorting opportunity there in a Russell. And it was a little bit of a bumpy ride down, but a lot more cleaner than, than the other indices, okay? Rusty is also down much more than the Quack or Dow. It looks to be about 20%. Okay, yeah, we can measure that. Yeah, this is the real – and here's the thing. This is a real deal. This is your bear market, folks. Um, Just look at the Russell 2000. We're down 22% since June. That's a pretty serious drop. That's that's a lot. Okay. I mean, I think the the uh, and I hate to say it, but the, doesn't the media call a bear market 20%? I think so. Don't we call that a bear? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I call a bear 50%, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, that's a bear market there, absolutely. Uh, this drop from here to here in an index, that's a huge drop. So, yeah, absolutely, that's a bear market. Yeah, we can call it a bear market if you want. Okay. Uh, Ernie wants to know about utilities. We'll take a look at those. Um, utilities have been really choppy in here, so I don't really see anything worth doing. Also, utilities – uh, tend to be a little bit lower in a little bit lower on the efficiency scale. Uh, stocks that are that are more inefficient, as a general statement, tend to offer better trading opportunities. And sometimes, just the flip side is true when it comes to a situation like now. So maybe the two Johnsons might be worth a short right now. So read the free report 
on my website, www.davelander.com slash store. And I make you walk through the whole store. So you have to scroll down to the bottom to get the free reports. But read the Go Go Nomo. So, and then as a general statement, I'm not a big fan of utilities, but sometimes companies reinvent themselves. And sometimes a utility can act more like a telecom company or maybe even a solar company or some kind of alternate energy company. So maybe there's something within utilities that might be worthwhile. But overall, right now, I'm seeing a big sideways arrow there and maybe a little bit longer term on a weekly chart. Kind of a slow rollover, albeit a choppy one. Okay. Plenty of small stocks down under 50%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Angelo is right. Uh, he says plenty of uh, small stocks down 50 to 60%. And I agree. And, and that's why I look at a few thousand stocks every day. And if you go back in the last, last week and then weeks prior, to that and even months prior to that when I when I go in and show you just real quickly what the what what I'm seeing in the database and go through a bunch of those stocks you'll see that I go through those stocks it's like okay down 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 and that's if everyone's like uh everyone's like well how did you see this coming it's like well come on guys it's obvious it's I'm no smarter than the other guy in fact they call me the trend following moron and I just look at a lot of charts and that gives you a pretty good feel for what's actually going on. Yeah, Susan says transport's really bad. I agree, Susan. Here's Susan again. Yeah, look, that's pretty ugly there. That's an oxymoron. And then, as I said a minute ago, on a weekly basis, that's pretty ugly. Let's take a look at a monthly just for SNGs. And monthly kind of looks like a pullback, but now it looks like a little bit more than a pullback. Look at the moving averages on a monthly beginning to roll over. So that's ugly. All right, I think we can uh, start looking it up. Let's say, uh, let's get some, let's talk about some stocks in here. A couple of more questions though, okay. Dave, great as usual, thanks for sharing question. I see you telecharts, she used telecharts, telechart, instead of TC2000, both from Wardens, I use TC2000, but on, on a weekly, SP only goes back to 2006. I noticed your weekly charts go back as much as, much further, 1990s. Uh, yeah, I don't know the reason for that, um, Terry. I uh, I never did get around to switching to the new one simply because I know initially there was um, a couple things that it didn't have, and then also I liked the local aspect of the of the uh, of the old version. I didn't want to be online for stuff because I, I just to me it seems like that would be slower, and that's why I never did get around to change it. But I, I understand there's a local version, a new one now. But yeah, I, I haven't really kept up with that. Okay, Phil might have the answer. TC2000 only gives you 200 bars of data on any chart. Oh, so you get more with the older version. Yeah, I might uh, – see, I didn't realize that, and that's kind of a bummer because when I do my daily scanning, um, what I do is I have a, a second window, and I go uh, – I, I put as many uh, bars as I can in this window. So let's say I'm looking at a stock, and I'll just pull a random one out the portfolio. I guess MOH would be a good one because it just comes to mind. So if you were able to see both of my screens right now, which I know you can't, but this is what it would look like, I would see this stock on the right. I use two screens for my scans or my flipping through charts, whatever, however you want to look at it. So when I see this sell signal set up here, this bow tie and first thrust here, okay, I say, hey, that looks pretty good. And then I look over here and say, hey, cool, that's coming off of, it won't let me draw it over here, but that's coming off of all-time highs. You see this all-time high here? So if I'm trading a transitional pattern like a bow tie or a first thrust, those are my two favorite probably when it comes to transitions. Then I know at the, at the highest that the most people are going to be on the wrong side of the market at the top. I'm sorry, not the top, but at, at the all-time highs. 
and that could turn into the mother of all tops. And that's why um, I look at it that way. So as Phil pointed out, you can get more days in the old version. And that's why I still use the old. That, I guess that's another reason I didn't even realize. Uh, I, I'm kind of bad with software. It's like uh, you have to, uh, you know, I just upgraded from DOS to Windows uh, last week. Uh, you know, it's like it takes me a long time to uh, <laughs> to get around to, up, uh, to updating. Susan says, VIX lower high on new low use of time entries. Well, I'm not as big a fan of the VIX as I used to be, but I do like to take a peek at it when the market is, uh, is, is, is acting like it is now. And as um, one of my newer clients, uh, Tom, if you're in here, um, hey, Tom, uh, had pointed out to me yesterday, he found it kind of interesting that the VIX wasn't up that much in the sell-off. And that's kind of an interesting thing. When you see the VIX up this much, okay, you know you're probably close to at least the short-term bottom in the market. But the market kind of, the VIX sort of shrugged its shoulders at that. And the VIX is a measurement of both calls and put, ad puts, uh, but of the implied volatility. And as a general statement, when you see a spike in the VIX, it's it's a, uh, everybody is just, rush it to hedge or there's, there's a, a lot of nervousness in the market. And when you see the market kind of, when you see the VIX kind of go to low levels, there's a bit of a complacency. Now, the thing you have to realize, it's a relative thing. So you want to make sure you put your moving averages in there and see where you are. So on a relative basis, it is pretty high. We could be due for a short-term bottom in here. But just looking at yesterday's action, it really wasn't up that much given the market was down so much. So, uh, the VIX only matters when it matters. So, yeah, keep an eye on it if you start to get some spikes in there. Uh, what's your point? It's being complacent so far? I, I think based on the VIX action, we could be in for more. But what I would it doubt, I just go back to the uh, underlying instrument and look at that. All right. Uh, can we talk about UNG? Okay, absolutely, Angelo. Uh, UNG I like. Uh, this is the natural gas um, ETF. And it looks like it's trying to bow tie in here. But so far, it's just kind of dropping down. So I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. But I would certainly put it on your radar and keep it on your radar as a possible, uh, as a possible long. Aaron says, joining us from Mississippi, Dave, if you have time, can you discuss using discretion with trailing stops? If not, no worries. Uh, sure. Uh, with a trailing stop, okay, first of all, there's two things with the discretion. There's a couple things. Um, let's see something here. Give me one second. If you take a look at... If you take a look at like uh, OZRK, let's take a look at that one from the portfolio. What I tend to do with the trailing stop is, and I don't know if you're asking about discretion on a daily basis or whatever, uh, but when a stock first begins to drop, I tend to trail on a one-for-one -one basis when we first get into it, okay? And then as that move begins to develop, I tend to allow the stop to widen out. And I'm trying to change hats from the long, from the short-term trader to the longer-term trader. And I, call, I play little games called like keep the change. So if it's a high price stock like this and it moves 20 cents or 30 cents or whatever, I don't bother adjusting my stop by 20 or 30 percent, 30 cents, not percent, cents. And I let that widen out just a little bit, slowly but surely, okay? Now, if you did want to, if you're, if you're talking about like on an intraday basis, sometimes you could actually try to squeeze a little bit more out of a trade. You don't want to micro, you don't want to uh, watch too many ticks. But let's say you hit your profit target and the thing keeps sliding. Let's say your profit target, I forget where it is. I could pull it back up. But let's say your profit target is, I don't know, 45 round numbers. You, 40, you, it, you see the market kind of dropping. You could trail a stop lower on an intraday basis and try to squeeze out a little bit more. I don't know if that's a question you're asking. Um, let me know if I answered that, and we'll move on. Uh, Facebook, okay? In your face, book. Um, 
Well, Facebook is beginning to break down out of this kind of a bow tie formation. It does have some, some sloppy trading back here where it could find support. I wouldn't rush out and short this one. But up or down, it looks like it wants to head lower. A little oversold here. It could bounce. But we do have a bow tie off of, I think that's all-time highs. Yeah, that's off of all-time highs. So I think it's in a lot of trouble. And that's why I had it in that list of stocks I showed earlier. It bounced off the 200-day. We can look at that if you want. 200-day moving average. Yep, look at that. Yeah, Phil's a big fan of those moving averages. And I can tell you where he's going to short it. He's going to short it when it retraces back up to this 50. I bet you 100 bucks he will. Okay, yeah, you were talking. Okay, Aaron was Aaron was asking about the day-to-day -day trailing stop. Yeah, it's it, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Well, there's rhyme or reason to it, but there's no exact to it. I'm just kind of letting it kind of open up. And then Aaron, I don't know if you followed me years ago with the service, but or looked at the archives. But years ago, I was a little bit more one to one on the first loaf, meaning that before we got the swing trade out, I was a little bit more one to one. If the stock, let's say we're long a stock, if it went up a point, I, I trail it up a point. Uh, or if it went up, I should say, 50 cents, I trailed it up 50 cents. But nowadays, I'm a little bit more lenient and letting that thing open up a little bit uh, or, or take my time on trailing the stop, which in turn allows it to open up naturally. And what Aaron is saying is, or the question is, if you take a look at like this, um, my little, this is what I call my nutshell screen. This is straight from the layman's guy that's trading stocks. And notice I kind of ratchet the stock higher as we try to get this little swing trade out. But once this stock continues to move in our favor, you let this stop begin to widen out. This is a lot is going to be a lot tighter than this. So there's a couple of YouTubes out there, and my apologies, I don't have them organized. I even had somebody volunteer to help me, and I didn't take them up on that. So that's my regrets. So. Uh, but, yeah, these YouTubes need to be organized. But if you go dig around there, I talk about them quite a bit. But the idea is to change hats from a short-term trader to a longer-term trader. Take the partial profits just in case this doesn't happen. But this is where the real money is. Unfortunately, if you just approach markets as a longer-term trader, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. And your accuracy is going to be about 23%. Okay. Can we use X fix instead of going long SPY while trending up? Well, I would, my quick answer is no. And Larry McMillan, who's a good friend of mine, and I'm not name dropping, I'm just friends with him. I'm all these guys I know through the, this uh, organization, the AAPTA X fix, X, XIX. Now, could somebody give me the definition of what the – can anyone here give me the definition of what XIX is? XIX. Oops. Can I get it? XIV. Okay. These are the Velocity Shares Daily Inverse VIX Short-Term ETN. Okay. So if somebody could look that up for me real quick, and we'll come back to that question. And if somebody can give me a definition, because I don't know the exact definition – FDX for confirmation, Dave. Let's take a look at that. FDX. And if not, I'll jump to one of my computers and look it up. Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. FedEx, these, um, you know, don't confuse the issue with facts. It seems like the Amazon Prime is really, uh, it's really pushing these guys. I talked to a UPS guy. <laughs> My wife gets a kick out of it. I talk to everybody, I guess because I'm here alone. It's like I, my garbage man is in my phone. <laughs> she gets the biggest kick out of that. I just – I talk to the mail lady. I'm uh, good friends with the mail lady. I uh, just, you know. Um, but, yeah, I talk to these guys, and I ask them questions and stuff. And um, and both FedEx and UPS are like Amazon Prime is the uh, – you know, well, UPS specifically with the Amazon Prime, uh, they're just busy as heck. But – yeah, the charts, the proof's in the pudding, right? Take a look at the chart. Chart looks like it's falling out of bed. Uh, what's your question on the, on the FedEx? I, I wouldn't short sell. I wouldn't sell a short, but I certainly wouldn't buy it. UPS is awesome. FedEx sucks. All right. 
maybe that's what he means. UPS. Well, UPS doesn't look too good either. Uh, Craig, you ship a lot of stuff. So what do you, uh, you ship stuff, don't you? Or, or no, you, no, you, you have dog products <laughs> that you're shipping or you receive a lot of products. Yeah. But you can see this UPS. That looks like, uh, that looks pretty ugly. Uh, that's kind of like the mother of all tops there. A big old base breaking down out of it. Um, that looks like something that you'd see in like an Edwards and McGee book where they got these long-term charts. Use USPS. Okay. So, and you short FedEx. Hey, can't blame you on that. Okay, XIV is based on the difference between the front and the second month options. Will decay when second month is lower than the front month. It is a synthetic third day combination of the two contracts. Okay. I was hoping it was based on futures because that becomes even a bigger mess. But... I guess the answer I would give you here is is listen to somebody like Larry McMillan, who knows way more than I'll probably ever know, who's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about the VIX and these type of instruments, and make sure you fully understand the instrument you're getting into, and more importantly, or as importantly, fully understand the behavior of that index, because a lot of people will hedge or try to hedge based on certain VIX indices which are based on futures and then you have a decay problem with the contracts in the futures and a lot of times they don't act any way like you think they would it is as i've seen um i don't want to get in trouble but but let's just say that people on tv occasionally get it wrong okay let's leave it at that portfolio managers use the hedge typically giving up a lot of money overnight yeah, hedging sounds good on paper. Now, Larry McMillan is running a fund where he understands what he's doing and he has a he has an he has an out of the money hedge using the VIX. And if the market only sells off a little bit, it doesn't really kick in, but if the market sells off a lot of bit, it does, okay? But he understands what he's doing. So, anytime you get into some sort of derivative type of trading instrument, I would strongly urge you to make sure you fully wrap your head around it, study it, and make sure it does what you think it's going to do. Okay. So I really can't I really can't answer your question other than um Phil's pointing out the XIV will gain, not lose, and not decay. So yeah, maybe the XIV is where you want to be. But make sure you fully understand the instrument. Let's put the let's let's just do something for S and G's real quick. Let's go to a, um, let's get a blank chart on the XIV. In fact, let's do this. Let's take a look at the spiders. Let's take a look at spiders and put the S XIV underneath it. And all I'm going to do here, let me put this in your window so you can see it. Just for S and G's, let's put the XIV as our comparison symbol. And we're going to put in, let me just put this over here so you can see it, X, I, V, okay. And if we look at these two, we could see as a general statement, they tend to move in the same direction as the overall market. So the piece, this is going down and that's going down. So I'm not sure how you would use that to hedge. Again, just fully understand the instrument you're you're dealing with and maybe maybe the moves now keep in mind that the scaling is not going to be the same for both of these instruments this is scaled to the spiders okay and this is just an overlay but it does not mean that down here does not mean it's weaker than this it's just scaled differently so take that into consideration when you're doing your analysis but to me it looks like they pretty much move in the same direction so i'm not sure how one could be a hedge, but if you, I guess if you think through it and work through it, maybe there's a way. But keep in mind that hedging is expensive. Yeah, you know, a good point, Matt, and, and we need to we need to move on from this VIX talk because I'm sure the, the people who are into it are going to say, no, Dave, let's talk about this. Maybe that's not right, or what, maybe we could do this. And the people who aren't into it are going to be like, oh, my God, <laughs> what are they talking about? So. But I do like what Matt says, 
the prospectus of the VXX and the XIV, inverse of VXX, say that the fund is expected to go to zero. Trade with caution. Yeah, any adverse fund, as a general statement, will go down longer term, okay? Karen says, Velocity Shares, ATNs.com, XIV, okay? Yeah, I wish there was a way to share links in here. I cannot do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, to answer your question, Bob, be careful uh, with the XIV and, and all these things. If if you want, uh, if you want, if you want the S and P to go up, then buy the spiders. If you want the S and P to go down, or you think the S P is going down, then sell short the spiders. Be careful when you start using a derivative of a derivative of the derivative of a third or, or a binomial ETN, which is another derivative to accomplish what you're, what, you know, just think about what you're trying to accomplish and go out and do it. Now, if you're Larry McMillan, that's a different story. You've been doing this. You wrote the, you literally wrote the book on options and you understand what's going on. Okay. But if that's, if, if he's an engineer, so if you're an engineer and that, that kind of stuff excites you, then by all means go after it and, 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 and work on it. But you know me, up, down, and sideways, okay? Okay, Howard says, copper used to mean economic growth strength. Look at the FCX. There might be problems. Yeah, I can't, uh, you know, you got to be careful with some of these old Wall Street adages that the, what is the stock market is a copper top, the bear market is a copper top, or the bull market is a copper top. But, yeah, based on the Freeport McMoron, you could see that obviously still in a downtrend. Now, this thing, I, boy, I, I hope this thing uh, just kind of bottoms out all year. That's going to be the mother of all buy signals. Okay. Netflix set up the same way. Okay. That's Phil. I guess he's talking about moving averages again. Let's take a look at those. Good bunch today, again. You know, you guys are making it harder on me. Uh, Y'all getting smarter and smarter, or smarter and smarter people are showing up. Make it a tougher for me. Tough job. But, yeah, I like that. Challenge me a little bit. But the bottom line is, you know, I'm going to keep it simple. So, what color? Let's make it pink or something. All right. Uh, yeah, you say, uh, Phil say that Netflix is coming down here and touching on that 200-day uh, moving average. Uh, Netflix is kind of wide and loose. I still think it's in trouble, though. And then let's put in a bow tie moving average. Yeah, it's bow tied down. I think it's still in trouble. And if it takes out whatever this level is here, how do we do that? I think if it takes out 94, you're looking at $70 a share. But I think there's other things to trade that might be a little cleaner. Group symbols are different. No MG. Oh, no MG indices? Ugh. God. Why did I, ugh. So the new one doesn't have the MG groups. I love the MG groups. Um, I was actually pulled aside at a conference once by uh, the people over in San Francisco at the TSAA uh, conference a few years back, and they were like, do you have any pull with TC? Could you tell them to not mess with the indices? <laughs> so it's like, that's what he meant. I didn't know what he meant because I, I was like, what's wrong with the Morningstar groups? They're fine. I love them. I think they're great. Okay. Uh, womp, womp. It's there, okay. Some people say it isn't. Some, but yeah. Let's not talk. To, let's not turn it to a TC conversation. That's another webinar. All right, good combination. After bow tie down, look for short a 50-day moving average. Yeah, I agree with you, Phil. And, and you're just kind of um, that. You're just kind of, you know, you're kind of echoing what I believe in. Is that sometimes you do have that throwback to the 50? I would imagine the transports probably did something like that. Once you have the sign and the signal. Then, and this is like on a longer term basis, you can see, let's take a look at a weekly transports. The, the, the sign and the signal, the sign is that they topped out, they're going sideways. And then you had the first thrust, that's your setup. And then the signal also was the bow tie. And then you had the sell off, okay? And sometimes you get that throwback back up to the 50 and there's nothing wrong with trading that i know you like to trade that phil and that's that's kind of a cool way to trade and i get it because you're trading with the trend you're just looking for that big picture retracement 
and that's fine. You're not out there. I'm not a big fan of the wave counting and things like that, unless you do it with trend, okay? BWLD. Oh, you mean Webster's, like the dictionary defines the uh, ugly as uh, <laughs> the rusty. No, I'm afraid we have a sideways trend here. Uh, whoever's, uh, I've deleted your question. Phil, you talking about Phil? No, it's, it's too sideways for now. But I hear you. Uh, it's definitely at a downtrend. Okay. Down, down, really down. Okay. Okay, RJ want to know about uh, EDU, but he had to leave. Okay, RJ, in case you're watching the um, um, recording of this, I think this stock is in trouble. And I think this – is this a uh, Chinese stock? I meant to mention this in my last Chinese update, my last update for the Chinese. Uh, you've got a – in fact, I'll put this in my uh, slide, so I'm glad you brought this one up. Um, let me make a note of that, EDU. Yeah, it's set up, and it's a possible short in here. You've got uh, coming off of um, nearly all-time highs, a thrust down, a little bit of a pullback. One thing I find with these educational stocks is they don't tend to um, – it tend to chop around a lot, but this one, uh, as you can see, does does trend at times. So, yeah, absolutely. Good eye on that one. Thank you, and thanks for bringing it up again. Uh, Ramish wants to know about Facebook, FB. FB. Anybody coming to uh, – anybody in Hong Kong in here today? Give you a shout-out. And hopefully I'll see you. Um, I have two presentations. I think one is going to be, going to be free, and I'll, obviously the second one's going to be paid. It's going to be an all-day thing. But uh, at least uh, come to the uh, free one. Uh, yeah, a little too late in this cycle for Facebook, so maybe wait for the next pullback. I do think it has it has some support in here and a lot of support down here. I guess that'd be a good problem to have. Um, you might be able to find something a little bit cleaner at high levels. Um, I would say DY, but that's already broken down. That's one that's uh, full disclosure in the portfolio. Uh, it didn't have quite as much support on the way down. Uh, what, what did MOH look like? MOH. Yeah, I mean, some all of these are a little choppy in here with some support, but the Facebook's got a lot of uh, choppy trading, so I think you can probably find something a little cleaner. Maybe the two Johnsons. I mean, that's a kind of a uh, – No, not the two Johnsons. I didn't look at the – no, going back to four. No, scratch that. Uh, Apple, AAPL. Um, it's not set up now. Apple could be a choppy kind of crazy stock to trade, um, but now it's starting to behave like a more like a normal stock. I guess on bounces and pullbacks along the way, I think at this juncture, I think you could still find some stocks at high levels that are just in the early phases of breaking down. I can't go to my Landry list, but there's a few in the Landry list today. So a week from now, check um, check that out. Okay, GFI pullback. It's going to be a gold stock. Yeah, it looks okay. Um, you know, these gold stocks aren't the cleanest stocks in the world, so you kind of have to uh, give them a little bit of a pass, and it's got some choppy, crazy trading all over the place. But I, I certainly give that an okay, considering that it is a gold, uh, and gold could be really choppy. But you got your bow tie off of all-time lows, thrust up. Yeah, I mean, I think you could do a lot worse than that if you're going to buy something. Susie wants to know about CCL and a bounce. CCL. Um, possibly, Okay. What was the other one? We tried to short it, but it didn't trigger. RCL, I think. Um, it's kind of wide and loose. I think I'd leave it alone, but I hear you. It looks like it's in the early phases of breaking down. RMR on a pullback. Yeah, I think so. Let's. It, it might be a little thin, but yeah, that would be your. Um, you know, with IPOs, this would be your first deep retracement here, and then this would be your your secondary signal coming up. So yeah, on a pullback, uh, a little bit on the thin side though, but yeah, it's got some volume here and there. But yeah, that would definitely make a, a possible pullback. 
Uh, the call on Apple was that it's in a downtrend, but it's a little too. Uh, you, uh, what did I say? I hope I say the same thing again. Uh, wait, maybe on a pullback, but I think it's it. Apple's kind of all over the place sometimes. Uh, I think I would find something at higher levels and try to short it, as opposed to jumping on the on the on the Apple. At lows this morning, only 13% of stocks were above their 200-day moving average. Wow. TC2107. TC, you always get something good out of Phil. That's why I like to have him. No, TC2107. Oh, and TC. How do I get to that index? Anyone know how to get there? Uh, component, industry, system. Warden Market Indicators, TC2107, right there. Percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average. Look at that. Good job, Phil. Thank you. So only 13 14% of all stocks are above their 200-day moving average. Can you believe that? That's amazing. That's really amazing. And for those of you who don't have – who haven't de devoted your entire life to this and you're busy out doing stupid things like saving people's lives and building buildings and stuff like that. Um, no, I'll kidding aside. If you don't have time to look at all these stocks, then by all means pick a few things like this to look at and get good at looking at them. Uh, maybe read Greg's got a book out there on uh, or an updated book out on um, uh market internals and you could actually you could actually see live charts on that at stockcharts.com i don't get any money for mentioning that although i have tried to uh <laughs> i have tried to uh and uh, greg's even tried to get me on with stockcharts.com so it's not for lack of trying but uh, yeah if you don't have the time then maybe study a fewer th fewer things if you can't go through all those stocks every night although i recommend you do then it's kind of interesting when you've got 13%, only 13% of all stocks are above the two and day moving average. So that's interesting information. Thank you. Stocks I've been stopped out of and longs never really traded mutual funds as I treat my them in longs thoughts. Stocks I've been stopped out on my longs never really traded my mutual funds as I treat them as long term. Well, the problem with treating a mutual fund as a long-term investment, like a certain talk show host may suggest, <laughs> is go back and just go back and read Layman's. Read the first chapter in the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, where I said that the S&P 500 in the middle of the year was down. 50% in 2008. And the average mutual fund was now what? 50%. At the end of the year, the SP 500, I think, was down 39 point something or 40%. And the average mutual fund was down what? 40%. So, unless you're in a fund that times the market, that gets out of the way when the internals begin to deteriorate. Like Greg told me years ago, uh, they, they uh, in their funds, they just use ETFs now, but they used to use individual mutual funds. And when Greg would start selling those funds, the fund managers would get all upset. And his point was, I'm doing you a favor. You're, you're gonna have, you're, I'm forcing you to raise cash. I'm forcing you to get out of stocks. So I'm actually doing you a favor. You're welcome, okay. But the problem is, and and I I don't want to I don't want to you know if you live in a glass house house don't throw stones I guess because we all we all get our turn in the barrel in this business. But the point I'm trying to make is that if the market goes down, so do they. Now, in all fairness, sometimes people in these funds have to follow their charter, which says hey, you have to be long stocks all the time. And if you're long stocks all the time, guess what? <laughs> the market goes down 50%, so will you, okay? It's, 
it's I would say it's nearly impossible to beat a market on a relative strength basis because that that sinking boat or I should say that falling tide will sink all ships. Uh, Bruce says EMAs or SMAs on your charts. Um, it all depends. Uh, I like to use a 50 day simple, but for the bow ties, 10 day simple, 20 day exponential, 30 day exponential. The reason I like that. 50 days simple is it gives you a bit of an inflection point sometimes. Uh, let me see if I can find a good stock that will give you a good example. When you have – notice the bow tie. It bow tied here, but it comes sharply into that 50-day moving average. That inflection point, the way it comes into that moving average sometimes can be uh, telling. Let me show you why. What do we do on black screen? See what happens here, just for S and Gs. So, let's say you have a a market, and um, oops, rewind that. Burp, 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 burp. Let's say you have the bow tie moving averages, and they're coming in like this, and you got a 50-day moving average. So, if you look at that angle of inflection, I didn't draw that very well. Let's see if I could draw that better. Let's try it again. Let's do this. Say this is your 50-day moving average, and let's say your bow tie looks like that on that 50. You got like a strong angle of inflection coming in. So I like the 50 as a reference. Okay, reference point. And then I like those other moving averages for the bow tie. I've I've done a lot of uh, YouTube's on the bow tie, so I don't want to bore everybody. Go in and watch those and. Uh, download the free report, davelander.com slash store, and scroll down to free reports and read the bow ties, okay? So I get a free report of that. Okay. Is that Ibu or Labu? My, there's no way to make the font bigger on this. Uh, Labu or Ibu? Let's try. Labu? Well, this is a, a biotech – this is three times leverage, so you want to toss that out unless, of course, you're doing something like a crazy day trade, okay? And that's fine. But you, you as a general statement, you don't want to get into these leverage things because the, the, the math doesn't work out, and then your your uh, tracking is going, to get, is going to be worse by a factor of three. Let's not get into that today. We've talked about that quite a bit before. So I think I would avoid this uh, thing for now, unless, of course, you're doing something like a day trade on that. Just for S&Gs, let's take a look at that. Maybe if you're doing one-minute bow ties or five-minute bow Let's try a one-minute bow tie. Just, just, let's just be stupid here for a second. So, yeah, if you're trading one-minute bow ties, you know, short here and then buy it here, uh, then by all means. But if you're going to hold it from day over day, do not do that. So one third retrace of a drop might be a pretty good place to short more. Uh, you talk about the overall market. Uh, I don't know. It's like Justice Potter Stewart, I think is his name. I know it when I see it. I don't know. We'll have to see it. Uh, right now, if the market just bounces up, then I would say – it stayed there that I'd say, well, we're just in the mother of all sideways consolidations. And then here, bull, there, bear. Okay. But right now I'm kind of bearish. It's looking kind of ugly. Susan Wolf says, lower high on new low used to time entries. Um, I don't use the VIX as much as I used to. But. What it does get stretched, you do you do have it's probably a minor buy signal working now because it's stretched away from the moving average. So I wouldn't necessarily use that to time the entry. I'm not trading the overall market as much as I used to. Now I'm looking at individual stocks, and then I know I know that my individual stocks are 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 due to get uh, hurt as the as the push goes against them with the um, when the market overall bounces. Okay, so 
I wouldn't use that for timing per se, but right now when the market's oversold and yeah, you might be getting that VIX signal kicking in to buy, I would maybe be very selective on your shorts, make sure they pull back a little bit so you're not shorting so much into that oversold market. Thank you on a 3K leverage info. I do, I do day trade it. I appreciate your feedback. Oh, okay, that's fine. Make it a great day. Yeah. Did I meet you in Vegas? I met somebody in Vegas. I was I didn't I forgot that I'm so like after these shows, everything's such a blur. I meet someone and then somebody else comes up and then um there's no way of keeping track of everyone in that in that situation. Oh, you're welcome, Angelo. Okay, Bob says EXR is going to the S&P. Would it be worth a shot? Well, I would never buy a stock just because it's going to go into an index, okay? That in and of itself. Now, with that said, it doesn't look bad, okay? you get It's in a longer-term uptrend. You've got the mother, a pretty good knockout move, but it's it's a real estate REIT. So I probably would trade it. Uh, the HV is pretty low in that of 19 um, it has lost a little bit of steam in here, but longer term, I, I hear you. So, yeah, it's a trend knockout. Um, it's okay. Uh, I think it would be a buy at 90 and change, and then you could put a stop down here in case you're wrong. I think you could find a lot worse out there on the long side. Yes, yeah, in Vegas, but just a short hello. I plan to city presentation next show. So you coming to, you coming to Hong Kong? Cool. See you there. <laughs> Was there tweet HV and beta? The short answer is nothing. Okay. Um, beta is just a measurement of H. Uh, beta is my, I'm sorry. HV is my way of measuring beta. Um, I don't know what the actual beta formula is, but if I see a stock that has an HV of 19 and we take a look at, let's just take a look at the spiders. Okay. HV of 16. Okay, I know that that stock is in line for the most part with the overall market, so it doesn't have a, a high beta, a so-called high beta, okay? But, yeah, use whatever you want. See you, Ron. Use whatever you want uh, to measure things, okay? Ah, next Las Vegas. I knew that's what you meant. What about uh, I'm going to be at uh, – I'll be at Traders Expo in uh, January, uh, February if you want to go there. Uh, nice and warm in, uh, in New York in February. Okay, just about out of time. What would you do with TSO now for Angelo? TSO. Um, I would continue to, if you're short, continue to follow it lower. Okay, it does have a lot of support below the market, as you can see, but th this is not something you'd want to establish a new position in just because it's kind of all over the place. But this did come up as a short not too long ago. But it did have some issues down here, and that's why we didn't take it. And it looks like it's it's finding support at that area right about now. Oh, you remember. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I love it when somebody um, remembers things. You got it from me. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's, that's you know, that makes my day. Um, F FCX, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they're going bankrupt or not, but uh, – don't these mining companies get really leveraged? And um, I, I don't know. I don't want to pretend to know anything about fundamentals because I don't. Yeah, it's too early to buy that one, Bars. Uh, earlier, if you were here earlier, we were talking about that one. Okay. All right. We're right at the uh, time limit here. Uh, one more. Anyone? Okay. Uh, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Remember, no show next week. I'll be in Hong Kong. And if you, um, you're you in China, that part of the world, then, <laughs> then uh, I got to stop reading these questions. Uh, then I'd love to see you. At least uh, pop in for the, uh, for the free meeting. And uh, I'd love to uh, shake your hand. Maybe we'll get a beer or something if you want. Uh, anyway, uh, if not, uh, I'll see you guys in two weeks. And girls, thank you so much for uh, coming. And uh, hope to see you again next week. Any questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you, Phil.